everyone, my name is Laura and I love dinosaurs. Like a lot. <laughs> I have a dinosaur tattoo on my foot, which I can show a picture of. I'm not gonna like kick my foot up. Uh, <laughs> This is Tristan, he's a Squishmallow, and he's a Triceratops, and I love him. And when I heard that the next Wayward Children book was going to have dinosaurs, I was so excited. Like, you don't even know. And then, when I got the E-Arc of it, I was floored. Uh, I have requested ARCs for every Wayward Children like the past three or four years and I've never gotten them. So to not only have gotten one and then gotten the one that I have way too high of expectations for was so great. But deciding when to read it is a whole other problem, right? Because <laughs> do I want to read it right now? and then have to wait until 2025 for the next book? Or do I read it closer to release date? As you can tell by the additional dinosaurs all around me, we've decided to read it now. And in tandem with that, I'm going to read The Paleontologist by Luke Dumas, which is a horror story about a paleontologist who returns to his hometown to work at the museum where his sister went missing when they were children. And I don't know what to expect from this. I'm a little, like, this was fully just an impulse purchase because it was horror and it was dinosaurs. I don't know how heavily dinosaurs will feature. Like, I don't know if this is gonna be like Night at the Museum where the dinosaur bones like come to life <laughs> or if it's like a different kind of supernatural or if it's going to be just like a normal human big bad but just taking place inside of a museum. I don't know. So I'm tentatively so excited and afraid. So we're gonna read Paleontologist and of course Mislaid in Parts Half Known and I'm so 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 excited. Additionally there's a couple little trinkets behind me because uh, <laughs> I went to Five Below just to kind of look for dinosaur stuff just to kind of see what I could find and this is like an excavation kit. It's called Unbelievable Science. You dig through jelly, sand, and two layers of rocks to dig out fossils. And the best part is you get to build a Triceratops, which is my favorite dinosaur. And so we're gonna do this and we're gonna bake a cake. Oh goodness, okay, things are chaos. Um, so we got this little, little cake mold <laughs> that um, I think it's basically gonna be like a cupcake's worth of cake. So I'm gonna make some cupcakes. And then uh, I found these Jurassic World hatchling build -a buildable dinos and they come in slime. So we're gonna see what this is while we're reading. And I'm probably gonna watch Jurassic Park because like, why not? And, and I'm getting a tattoo of a dinosaur. <laughs> um, and I think that's everything. So I am excited to start reading these. I will catch up with you guys when I have something more to say. My house smells so good right now. <laughs> and the dinosaur, I did overfill it. Love that for me. I didn't, um, it didn't spill. So that was good. But he's very fat. So those are the beautiful cupcakes. Eh. This is our chunky little dinosaur. <laughs> Chapter two. Inside these hallowed halls, find death. Simon lingered in the entrance hall, attempting to contact his supervisor in defiance of his phone's remonstrations of no service. The best he could manage was to tap out an email requesting clarification on what- But I decided the second I got back from my walk, it would be a good time to frost the cake. What matters is I actually started reading my book, finally. 
and I am three chapters into The Paleontologist, and I'm hoping it gets better. <laughs> like, I don't dislike it, but I'm not immediately hooked. Simon is, has his job, this new job, in Pennsylvania, and he is the, like, local paleontologist for this museum in Pennsylvania and today is his first day and he gets there and there's nobody there. He can't get in, he's banging on the doors. <laughs> and finally a janitor comes and opens the door and he's like, bro, we're closed. Um, it's a pandemic, not sure if you're aware of this, but we're not open. <laughs> and he's like, well, I have a job. Today is my first day. And the janitor's like, well, that's weird. No one told me that. And also everyone but me works from home. So, um, what are you doing here? And <laughs> so like, that's weird, right? Why would, oh, the dinosaur's head. Why would you um, hire this guy and then not tell him what to expect on his first day or like what he's supposed to do or where he's supposed to go? Can you get down please? And so all that's weird. And mind you, Simon has been telling us that he had red flags from this interview and he never thought he'd come back to Pennsylvania because turns out this is where he grew up and he never wanted to come back but for some reason he took this mysterious job and it's screaming red flags at him. Uh, this looks nothing like a dinosaur now. I made him green. <laughs> it's for five dollars it's great but uh, it the green was kind of unnecessary <laughs> because you can't tell what it is, but that's okay. It's going to taste great. And yeah, so he's kind of like, okay, janitor, what should I do? And the janitor's like, well, I don't know what to tell you, but like, definitely don't go chasing sounds. Like if you hear something, no, you didn't. And that's weird. I'm assuming because it's a horror novel something goes bump in the night. I don't think it's going to be the janitor. And then we find out that actually, not only did he grow up here, but his younger sister went missing in this museum. No one knows what happened to her. My guess is it's the bump in the night thing. And so he obviously never really wanted to come back. So why he took this job, we don't know. And then we found out that his mother is um, not a great mother. She has a lot of problems and his aunt finally intervenes after his sister's disappearance and takes him away to Chicago where he then finished growing up and going to school and working at a museum there until now he's suddenly back in tiny town, Pennsylvania. And by tiny town, I mean, I don't remember the name of the town, but it's a small town where everyone kind of remembers him, but he's pretending like he's never lived there before. Just like, nope, it's not me. And they're like, okay, well, we know it's you, but like, we'll let you pretend. So that's all I really know. And it's fine. Um, I'll be curious to see once like the mysteries get started, how I'm gonna feel because there was one spook out where he was looking in a, like the glass and he saw something moving behind him and then when he turned around there was nothing there so I'll be very curious to see what that was and like expectation wise do I want the skeletons to be alive and causing mischief kind of but for that to be the case there's got to be a good payoff and I don't know what a good payoff would be if the dinosaur is, cause like, if you're getting chased by sentient bones, that would be terrifying, but also like, it's just bones, right? I feel like that's not super hard to like battle. <laughs> it's just bones. Now granted, if the jaw gets you, that's where you're in trouble, but, they don't have any, they don't have a lot of mass 
and they have a lot of ways you could tangle them that you couldn't necessarily tangle um, a solid creature, right? So I don't know what I want the big bad to be or where I want this to go. And I suspect that the sister going missing is the real mystery. And because she never showed up again, I'm feeling like she was kidnapped and not eaten by dinosaur bones. So I'm assuming that there is a corporeal human um, big bad. Okay, so I've read nine chapters. That's where I stopped. And I am way more invested now than I was like an hour ago. So that's really good. And what we're learning is that Simon's, oh, she's sitting there purring at me. Look how cute she is. Oh, I love her so much. Okay, so Simon's predecessor left very abruptly, which we learned like in like the first chapter or sorry, I don't know, but his lab was basically looked like this guy left one day, like just to go home like normal and never came back. Like it was full of his stuff. So he's kind of like, what? That's weird. And then he starts talking to other people who work at the museum, 99% of which are through zoom because no one comes into the office and they're just like, yeah, he went mad. And he was in the midst of discovering like a, a T-Rex or one of their relatives, but like a big um, carnivore that the museum hasn't had before. So they're like, we need you to finish that project. And it's a really old project. And so Simon's kind of like, okay, like, I guess I'll do that. But why are you being weird about it? Like, why is this such a weird thing? And they're like, oh, well, like, your predecessor went mad. They Like, he was seeing things that weren't there. And he almost jumped out of a window. And basically implying that this project made him go mad. And <laughs> Simon has now found the bones because, like, no one knew where they were either. Which is, like, a whole other thing. Like, what is going on in this museum? He finds the bones, like, in this, like, very hidden room. Which we also learn more about that in a really disturbing way. And... We're just now getting to the part of like, is Simon getting, I don't want to say possessed by the bones. <laughs> That's not exactly right. But like, are they affecting him? Like, is there something going on with these bones? Or like, is Simon just kind of dealing with the traumas of his past? And also something that makes a lot of sense now um, <laughs> that this being a set during the pandemic, like late 2020. So when everyone was going stir crazy everyone was very fearful people were um people were dying there was no vaccine so you know all kinds of just agitation and you know is that all catching up with simon or are these bones haunted and i don't know and i don't even know what i want but i am actually really invested now i have a kitty on my lap so i'm not not trying to adjust any of these angles because I don't want to disrupt her as I immediately disrupt her. Um, I'm getting very invested. I'm 16 chapters in, which is like probably 25%. And um, <laughs> I'm actually listening to it on Spotify a lot because I'm playing Coral Island at the same time because I just remembered that the full game is about to come out and my the only thing you can keep from the early access is your like net worth. So I'm trying to <laughs> sell all my stuff and get through everything. So I'm um, doing some farm cleanup. Anyway, uh, two things that I wanted to talk about is the fact that <laughs> uh, Simon's boss wants him to put together this skeleton that Dr. I think his name is Dr. Mueller. Is that what it is? I think so, Dr. Albert, M Albert Mueller. He had found that not Tyrannosaurus skeleton. And so Simon's boss is like, hey, like you can reconstruct this, right? And Simon's like, no, I need a team of people to do this. And he's like, 
but no, like you can do it. Like we, we don't have a budget, so uh, we can't hire anyone else. So you have to do it. But you've done that before, right? And I was like, no, I, I have not done that before. And his boss is like, well, that's not good. We assumed you had because you're a paleo whatever. And so I was like, yeah, I'm a paleontologist. People who physically like set up exhibits and like put the skeleton. Really, Stormy? I did everything to not let you run away. Oh, new Jay gonna take her spot? Okay. Anyway, so this boss is just like woefully unaware of what he does. Um, and Simon's like, if I were to do this by myself with no experience, it's gonna take me a minimum of two years to get it done. And his boss is just kind of like, man, you suck. <laughs> it's like, that is, that's so relatable though to have a boss who has no idea like what your job is, even though they hired you to do the job. So I can relate. And then the other thing that I've missed out on by listening to the audiobook. So um, it's a really good audiobook. I actually really like the narrator and the way he's like, there's like sound effects um, because like, is he being chased by phantom like sentient museum creatures? Hi, Nug. I don't know. But he's reading through Dr. Albert Mueller's journals and also I love that because I feel like we're gonna see his descent into madness and I'm here for it but to distinguish his journals they have um this different coloring to them which is nice and they tell you like that they're full they're from his journals but like there's all this artwork of dinosaurs and I'm missing that because I'm choosing to listen to it so like if you read this um I think kindle or physical is the way to go because of the pictures but it was free with my Spotify, so um, I'm listening to it so I can uh, snuggle the cats. They've switched places. This is Nug. Nugget came to visit and play my game. So I'm going to go keep listening and keep playing. So I finished The Paleontologist. And I don't love it. <laughs> I really wanted to. Um, also, this has nothing to do with the content of the book. But like, I barely opened this book because I listened to so much of it on Spotify. Why is it so... Like, whoever is making covers like this, stop it. This Like, this was doing this before I opened it. Like, why is it so... I want to say malleable. Is that the word? But like it shouldn't curl this much ever but especially when i've barely touched it like and just as a side note when i bought it i fully thought i was getting a hardback and that's on me um i don't know if it didn't come out in hardback or if i just am stupid both are plaus plausible <laughs> but i'm gonna stop holding it i didn't like it like it was fine and I'm going to be honest, I don't know how you can tell a story with dinosaurs in the present day and have it be believable because dinosaurs aren't currently roaming the earth. So I think how they included the dinosaurs was good. I liked that enough. Um, the overarching point of the story is that Simon has returned to his hometown to kind of put his sister's memory to rest. She has, she went missing when they were children. The investigation was poorly done because his mother is a drug addict and wasn't able to remember anything about his daughter, her daughter. So they had a hard time even searching for her because other than her school photo, they didn't know what she was wearing and what she really like looked like on that day. Like the mother didn't even know her daughter's eye color Although that seems like that could have been easy to find. That's neither here nor there. And that's not, that's not even a judgment on the book. That's just like shitty police work, right? So that's like the main story. And that is on the cover. I knew going in, he was looking for his sister. But when you tell me it's a horror story about dinosaurs, I expect more dinosaurs. Uh, <laughs> And I don't even know that this, like, I'm having a hard time trying to articulate 
why I'm disappointed because I don't even know if it's really that bad of a book. I think my expectations were just too different to what the story wanted to be. And the other things I had an issue with, it's set during COVID, which makes sense because they wanted the museum to be empty with a plausible reason and to kind of give financial strife as to why the staff is so bare bones. <laughs> um, and that all worked and I didn't mind that. But what I did mind was the constant, 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 constant reminders of COVID. And again, not inaccurate, but not something I'm personally ready to be just reliving so intensely. Like every, like constantly talking about the masks and the six feet rule and like people being wary of handshakes and all of it was accurate and not even poorly included. Like I do actually feel like the way it was discussed was realistic. I just didn't like it. <laughs> and that's on me. I don't, I think, um, I would need to probably read more reviews about it, but it just, it was too much for me. Like we're barely out of this pandemic and like, it's not over, like not realistically. And to just kind of be reminded of it was just too much for me. <laughs> so we've got that going on and okay. So here's a weird thing. This book was blurbed by AJ Finn who wrote uh, The Woman in the Window. <laughs> and that really should have been its own red flag <laughs> because I didn't love that either. We probably could have had less COVID. So we're following Simon trying to figure out the mystery of his missing sister all the while reading these journals from the previous paleontologist who is clearly losing his mind and is convinced he is seeing things, um, mostly the dinosaurs coming back to life at night. And there is this like, is he seeing this or is he insane? And that does get answered sort of, um, in a way that makes sense. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like it's answered, even though I don't know that we got a concrete answer. It worked. But then by the end, you get the villainous monologue that was so, it was just exposition for exposition's sake. And there was this moment and like, I don't know, like every, this is a spoiler. So if you care, but in every movie book, everything, every storytelling medium, when someone is villainously monologuing to you and over insisting that you drink the drink that they prepared for you, it's roofied. It is always roofied and or poisoned. Always, without fail. So why do we keep doing it? It's not a secret. It's not like Simon is sitting there getting exposited to. Meanwhile, this villain <laughs> is like, oh, you're not drinking your tea. Hey, you haven't touched your tea. Hey, you want to drink that tea? Like, dude, you are literally telling this man about all of these atrocities that you've committed. Why would he drink your tea? And then the dumbass does. Why? Why would you drink it? Even, even no, there's no reason Simon should have drunk that tea. None. Because if your only concern, and he does not have this inner monologue, but like Simon is intelligent for the most part throughout this entire book. And then he just drinks this tea and has no second thoughts about it. Like there's even a point where Simon says, oh, they added something to the tea or some, the milk or something. And he didn't see what it was. He's obviously poisoning you. There was no... That made me so angry because why, why, you know, it's poisoned, you know, it's poisoned, you're stupid. And there was no reason for you to be stupid. And then, you know, he passes out. And then when he wakes up, he was just miraculously saved by a very, very decrepit old man and someone who had fled the scene earlier for unknown reasons. Of course they came back, but it was all just like, I don't know. He was very passive, which I didn't like. <laughs> So that all, so that, that turned me off. And then after that whole scene, 
and then the kind of wrap up with how he got saved. Then there is what feels like an epilogue of just like, oh, and in, in the short future, these are, this is what happened to the museum. This is what happened to the people in the museum, how their jobs changed. Um, all of that, which feels like an epilogue. And I knew it wasn't because it didn't say epilogue. <laughs> and I was like, okay, it's probably the last chapter. And then it just keeps going and going. And then there's like a whole, I mean, it was short, but there's like a whole other, like almost, I, I don't want to say new storyline because it is tying up something that was discussed, but it didn't, it could have literally ended with this epilogue and then Simon approaching the donor and saying, Hey, you and I have this connection about things. I don't know why I've suddenly gone back to non-spoilers, but I have. And so we have this connection about this thing and I need a research trip to Colorado. Can you fund it? And the donor says, yes, that could have ended it because then, you know, okay, they're tying up that storyline, but instead we have to go to Colorado, <laughs> have more conversations about this connection. And then another year passes. <laughs> And it felt so unnecessary. And then there was an epilogue. Um, and then, okay, back to spoilers. I don't know anything about making bone china. I also probably naively did not realize that um, it was ever made of bone. I don't know if it still is. It probably is. There's plenty of bones to be found. But I did not know that uh, bone china was made of bones. But the way this villain talks about how to make china out of bone he says that he wanted an adult but he would have he would have been satisfied with two children to make this china which is why he abducted the sister and then he was unable to abduct simon and then they find the sister's skeleton but she didn't have, if, if your concern was that you didn't have enough bone from one child to make this tea set, how did she have leftover skeleton? And then her skeleton is in the museum in a way that implies that it was a full or full enough skeleton. So did you not use all of her bones? And, okay, so that confused me. I did not look into how to make bone china. That might answer my question. Do you not use the bone? Do you, like, is it, like, the marrow? Like, is he extra? Like, I don't know. I don't get it. But what I feel like I am understanding is he used her bones to make bone china, but somehow had enough bones left over to leave her skeleton behind. But he had a whole tea set of her bone china. Like, a whole set. And his motivation, can we talk about that? His whole motivation was to talk to his mother again because she died in a car crash and he wasn't able to say goodbye. So he just starts killing people to make bone china to communicate with her through, um, I believe it was a Zulu tradition, I think is what he said. And I'm not negating that practice of the Zulu tradition of, I think they, I think he said that they use bone china to communicate with people who are gone. I'm not negating that tradition. I am, I have a big problem with his motivations of, um, I wasn't able to say goodbye to my mother. And now as a seemingly elderly man, he's considered to be geriatric. So 60 plus, uh, and he was young. It's been, I think 20 years at least since the sister died. So for a minimum of 20 years, this man has been just chill with being a murderer to say goodbye to his mother. I have not lost my parents. I have been very fortunate. I have not lost a lot of people in my life. Um, and I would be devastated to lose someone and not be able to say goodbye. I am not negating how hard that would be. Um, and if my mother died unexpectedly, I would be crushed. Uh, I would not murder people as a response to that tragedy. There's a huge disconnect there. 
Uh, because yes, would I want to say goodbye to her? Would I want to talk to her again? Absolutely. I would go to a psychic. I would maybe fall into religion. Probably not. I'm fairly atheist on that. But like, I would do a lot of other things than murder someone to make china. His idea of using animal bones to make bone china, that was a little weird because like you're still murdering animals. Like I don't know how you can stomach that. But that at least is like, okay, I could almost see that. You don't murder children <laughs> to say goodbye to your mother. That is, Ill your mother, I assume, would not be happy about that. If my mom found out, if she died unexpectedly and then found out I turned into a murderer to talk to her again, she would be so mad at me, she would recorporealize to murder me. Are you kidding? That would not make her happy. <laughs> like, so his motives, like, could he not have lost a child? That makes more sense to me than your parent. And not because you can't love your parent fiercely and not that your parent can't be your best friend, but you know you will lose them. As a matter of fact, you grow up knowing that fact. Um, so, I don't know. Again, that is a place of privilege I am coming from that I do not know loss like that, uh, for which I am currently quite grateful for. But it's still a weird motivation. No parent would want their child to turn into a murderer to say goodbye to them. No one. That's not how parents operate. So he's just a murderer using this as an excuse, but we don't go there. So anyway, I hate all of his motivations. I hate everything about that. And then he exposits for so long that I was, I, and I don't know, like, obviously you want the answers. I don't know how else, I'm not a writer. <laughs> I don't know how else to get them, but I do know that I don't like exposition dumps, which is what that was. Um, yeah, so that was a flop and a very disappointing first book. I feel like it's a two star. I think it was three stars before I started talking, but then I got really angry about the ending. So I think it's a two star. And I'm not happy about that. What do you think, Stormy? She's sleeping. She doesn't care. She listened to that ending, too. She is not nearly as outraged. Hello, editing Laura is here. Um... I would recommend, <laughs> if you have not caught up on the Wayward Children series, I would just click off now. Um, I don't go out of my way. My life is living in a glare. Hey, look, it's my TV. Uh, <laughs> the woes of being blind. So I kind of freely talk about the Wayward Children series um, in general. I don't explicitly talk about book nine. I try very carefully to not have any spoilers about that book. Um, obviously I'm talking about it so there are inherently a level of spoilers just because I'm talking about that book <laughs> but I don't spoil the plot and well the plot beyond what's in the description and I honestly think I kept more to myself than was actually necessary. <laughs> like, I think some of the stuff I was trying not to say is in the description of the book. But the first eight books I talk about freely. So if you were not caught up on the series, I would just click off now. Um, yeah. So this will have spoilers for the first eight books. And if you haven't read the first eight books, I highly recommend that you do so because they're really, really, really good. <laughs> but um, spoilers for the rest of this video. Number nine, I think is my favorite. Back to the past. Stormy's going nuts. Don't bite me. <laughs> Goober. Okay. So. A lot has happened since I read The Paleontologist. I got sick. And I got a tattoo. And I read the entirety of Mislaid and Parts Half Note. <laughs> and I made no updates. Because I got... Or I'm sorry. I read the first half of Mislaid while I was getting my tattoo and I don't record in public so I couldn't record any of that not that I wanted to <laughs> it's in so much pain I will show it later it is all right here it's like warm to the touch it's it's the biggest tattoo I've gotten so it's 
it was a lot. It hurt. Um, it's beautiful. I love it. Her name is Ellie. I don't normally name my tattoos, but it's a dinosaur tattoo. It felt like I had to name it. And if you are unaware, it is named Ellie because it is a Triceratops and I'm obsessed with Jurassic Park. Duh. Hence this vlog. And, um, Dr. Ellie Sattler like has a scene with the Triceratops. So it felt fitting. Um, and while I kind of talk about mislaid and parts I've known, I'm going to kind of play with these trinkets because I still haven't opened them yet. And I'm at this point, I don't know that I'm going to reread Jurassic Park right now. I have been, I've slumped so hard in November. Uh, it's absurd. I've read maybe four books this month, which is a lot for some people. And I have no judgment about how fast people read. But normally, let's see, it is November 18th. I normally would have read like um, closer to nine books by now. And I'm kind of just not liking anything, except for Miss Lady Parts Have Known. I really loved that, so that's great. So first of all, this is the egg. And I can't open, this is a child's toy. Why? Um, so, oh. There's a packet of slime. So playing in slime is more fun with washed hands. All right, so we're not gonna open the slime. I think the whole point is you combine them in the egg, maybe. I'm not gonna do that. I just wanna see what the dinosaur is. Oh, look at that. So Miss Laden Parts Half Known was interesting to me because A, it reminded me how much I really need to reread the entire series because there are so many nods to the previous books where I'm like, I know that's a reference, but I can't fully remember it. Um, so first of all, I need to do that. And if you are not someone who rereads them, <gasps> okay, there's, it, there's two pieces, but it's a Triceratops, which is my favorite. Um, Okay, so I'm not gonna stick her in slime. She's got a derpy little face, but like, she's a cutie. Um, so what's interesting about this one is, a, like, you're gonna have to forgive me if I am wrong, because like I said, I haven't reread the entire series. Why can't I set this down? This is the first time, I think, that we are following the same character back to back like i know we've had two books about jack and jill but this one follows ansi pretty much immediately after uh lost in the moment and found i mean there's obviously like a time gap because i think that book ends with her finding um Ms. angela's mom so that was immediately interesting to me that we kind of <laughs> Stormy, <laughs> I can't with you. Um, but I really, really liked Ansi and I loved the store. So it was exciting for me to actually have her be the protagonist again. And I kind of feel like lost in the moment and found and mislaid and parts half known are basically one story. Okay, there's a lot happening. That is 50% my cat being an aggressive lover and half me not knowing how to open a box. Jesus, okay. All right, my beautiful, loving little girl. Can we be affectionate somewhere else? What are your thoughts? I love you too. Okay, now please go that way. Thank you. Oh good, this is gonna be such a mess. I should not have planned to do this with absolutely no anything on my table. But like, okay. oh no, oh no. Stormy, that's not a toy. Um, well, it is a toy, but it's not a cat toy. No! Oh, God. Oh, goodness. So, oh. Oh, 
they go on this thing. I could read the instructions. They're not instructions. <laughs> Cover your workspace with a work, Cover your work area with a newspaper and wear old clothes. I'm gonna wear my favorite sweater, not cover my work area. Um, the tool will help you start digging. Thank you. It's, I am assuming, oh, okay, I get it. I get it, kind of. Can I, can this one? Great, okay. I don't know that that is correct. Whatever, it's fine. So, <laughs> we're following Ansi as she enters Eleanor West's school and she's feeling very out of place. She's rooming with Cora. Eleanor keeps calling everybody nonsense even when they're not, which speaks to what I'm calling my theory, but at this point is probably fact and I'm just dense, that as Eleanor declines, because that's been talked about throughout the books, that she's declining mentally. And it's kind of, I think the idea is that she's going to sort of decline enough that she's a childlike again and then she goes through her door, at which point Cade will take over. I don't want that to happen in book 10 because I want it to keep going because it just sounds like it's going to be the last book. And I really think that Eleanor's going to go through her door and we're going to get Cade's story. Although we could, we could get, get Eleanor's story and then Cade's story, which would give us 11 books. But then the odd numbered ones are at the school. So 10 could be Eleanor and 11 at the school. 11's a normal number then, whatever. That's not important. So, um, but so what's interesting is this book kind of spans through three books, I think. Because when Auntie shows up, it's right before Cora goes to the other school, which if I'm remembering rightly was book seven. And so it kind of starts there picks up like they, they talk about Cora leaving and then immediately coming back <laughs> so like we, we skip over that time jump and then the story really starts when people at the school realize that Ansi can find anything so long as it exists and she is aware that it's missing like she can't she doesn't stumble upon like like if she finds your lost thing but nobody knows that it's lost like she won't find it if that makes sense like she could see it but she wouldn't know it's lost and therefore would not it up. So she's obviously a hot commodity at the school because things that she can find include doors and obviously everyone at the school, not everyone, but most everyone wants to go back. And this ends up leading to a quest despite Eleanor's no quest rule. But it's a quest by accident and we go to a fair few worlds. And when I started this series, I would have told you that Sumi was annoying and possibly my least favorite character. I didn't love her in book one and her, I mean, it was her daughter more in, I think it's book three. Is it book three? I think it is. Um, Beneath the Sugar Sky. But like in general, I kind of found her annoying. Tell me why she is like my favorite. I highlighted so many quotes in this and almost all of them were from her. So many good quotes, particularly in the last third, which is of course the ones I can really not share. Uh, okay, this is one of my favorite Sumi quotes. People who can't change aren't really perfect and no, and no matter how much we love, and no matter how much we love it somewhere, that doesn't mean it's good for us. And the context of that is important, but like it's a good quote on its own. She also has a good part about talking about semantic satiation, which, or I'm sorry, semantic satiation, which is a word that I learned maybe, or a phrase that I learned, I think maybe high school, college, because it is a phrase you're familiar with, even if you're not familiar with it, where if you say a word too many times, it loses all meaning. And the phrase for that is semantic satiation. <laughs> and I love that she talked about it. It's really kind of like a non-plot point, but just, 
everyone has experienced that moment and not everyone realizes that there is a name for it. So I love that that's in there. And then two other ones I think that I can say were perfectly normal in the right environment. And if that is not just, oh, oh, no, um, just so accurate because how many times do you feel like imposter syndrome or just out of place, but in the right environment, you're thriving. And I think that that is just a super important thing to keep in mind. Like you may not be normal in every circumstance, but you're normal in the right environment. And I think we need to keep hold of that. And the last one is not really anything. I just liked it, which is salt's like salt. It spreads around. Oh, there's a bubble. I don't know what I did, but I got a bubble. Okay, I didn't, oh, I did pop it. Okay. So we have I even talked about this book? I, I wanted to read this because of the dinosaurs on the cover. If you're going into this expecting a dinosaur book, kind of disappointing like dinosaurs are in it and the way that they're in it the way that they're used I loved I think it was a really good and probably the only way in a story like this that you're going to uh, be able to use them I thought this would be bigger not gonna lie this is a lot of slime for that to be the only thing in it Good thing this was five dollars and <laughs> so it's not the dinosaur book that i was expecting based on the cover but i don't think you can really include a lot of dinosaurs in a world of humans like unless you make them talking dinosaurs and like we always have Hudson from the store who is a talking animal so it's not outside the realm of possibility to have talking dinosaurs but at what point is that cheesy so I think they were used appropriately but if you're going into this expecting kind of like a Jurassic Park level adventure it's not that but I really did enjoy it um and it's also really making me want to reread book seven or whichever one is up the um is it where the drowned girls go the one where they're at the other school is this just a rock did i just did i just find a rock am i charlie brown i got a rock it's a rock um oh oh there's a fossil okay that's cute we get to follow our questers which is kind of how they're known at the school because they're the only ones that ever go on quests. So it's like your main crew, Christopher, Cora, Cade, Sumi, and kids from the new school. And, oh God, this, this one, this is gonna be messy. And they, after an experience with Serafina, See, and this is why I need to reread the books. I don't know how much Serafina was in it before. Oh, wow. How the heck do you dig into this? Yeah, this is going to be super messy. Um, so, Sarah, thank you. Serafina finds out that Ansi can find doors. And because she has this ability to essentially persuade anyone to do anything because of essentially how beautiful she is um she tries to corner people into doing things for her and she traps antsy and is trying to get her to open her door and the questers come and save her and then to escape from her antsy opens a door and that leads to a multi-door adventure and I'm not going to tell you where they go because that was so much fun discovering. Like obviously one of them is a world with dinosaurs. Like that's that's a given. I won't I won't deny that. But the other doors are very interesting and gives me a lot of hope for book 10. But since I don't want to talk about where they went, <laughs> 
I will get back to the dinosaur world in a second. I kind of, I really want Serafina's story now because Ancy, having spent so much of her time with Doors, has learned so much about, um, I think they call it a nexus, just like what these worlds are, what their doors look like, what people um, who, like, she can kind of determine where people went or like, you know, she, she knows Cade went to a fairy world. She knows Cora went to a water, a, did she call it a water world? Um, but she then says Serafina was in a water world. And Cora's like, no, she wasn't. Like, girls, you know, dry as a desert. And she mentions there's this other world. I have bent this tool. Um, where there are essentially people who live on boats. And there's also, of course, you know, water people. They don't specifically call them mermaids, so I don't know that they are mermaids. But, like, both can exist. And so she thinks Serafina was at one of those worlds. So now I really want to know more about that world and how the heck I am supposed to... Like, this is... This is literally a rock. So I'm very curious about her. And that is someone I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to on a reread to see how much she is talked about because I want her story now but through trial and error we end up in the dinosaur world I think that's all I want to say about that and we come across someone from the past whose story I actually don't remember uh, she hasn't had her own book but she was mentioned, she was, a, she was either mentioned or a character in another book. And because my memory is not great, I don't remember her, which is another reason why I want to go back. And she has this whole speech about how living in this world of dinosaurs as the only mammal is actually the perfect world for her. <laughs> and I think that's incredibly interesting because she talks a lot about how, like, what being social means and what loneliness is and how there isn't one right way to be social. There isn't like everyone's opinion on the matter is completely different. And just because you think she might be lonely doesn't mean she is like she has learned how to cohabitate with these dinosaurs and she knows how to communicate with them. Like she's not lonely, even though, you know, to an outsider, how could a human survive in a world that is populated only by dinosaurs and I think that had a lot of interesting conversations I really liked the way that uh Shannon described the dinosaurs she went with the the feathery description which was nice since Jurassic Park even in the new ones really didn't and am I even making progress and I don't know, that world was really interesting and we spent the correct amount of time there. Although I would not mind getting this girl's story of how we got there and how she kind of learned to survive there. Because I think, oops, all that to say, because the book is not out yet, I don't want to spoil it. Um, it was probably my favorite of the series. Ansi, I think, has one of the most interesting stories because she had a very tragic childhood, both at home and at the store. And then she goes to the school where her headmistress is kind of losing, not losing her mind, but she's fading. And all of the students effectively just want to use her so they can get to their own doors without caring what that means for her. Because what these children don't know is that the doors take time off your life. And it doesn't matter if you're only going through once or twice. That's only a couple of days. You're really not going to notice. But Ansi, who is a teenage nine-year-old, <laughs> um is all too aware of the price and obviously 
Oh, that was so stupid. Doesn't want that life. And I liked how her story ended. And I really liked the epilogue. I think it was a well-deserved epilogue. And I am devastated that I'm going to have to wait till 2025 for a new story. But I'm not disappointed that when this book comes out, I'm going, like, officially, I'm going to reread the whole series because I'm hoping Barnes & Noble does another buy one, get one half off sale on hard covers and I can maybe complete my set. That would be nice because I have three. <laughs> I need all of them. So this, this, where did that go? Okay, so we're gonna ignore this mess. <laughs> This is not the project I thought it would be, which is stupid. It's exactly as advertised. All that to say, I have not really talked in depth about this book because I don't know what to say about it that isn't gonna spoil it because it's so short. Um, and I want people to experience it on their own because there's a lot of things in there that I was like, oh, that's really interesting. That's really, I want to say surprising. I don't know if that's exactly the right word. Like, granted, I am not someone who frequently, she's like, oh my God, when I read. Like, that, I don't usually have strong reactions. I do think, I do think people will have that reaction. What you, that is also not a toy, my girl. I think that could, I think people could have that reaction to some things in this book. And I don't want to take that away from them. So my final thought on this book, it's a five out of five and <laughs> it's really good. It has dinosaurs as advertised, perhaps not as many as you were thinking, but they are there. Ansi is one of my favorite protagonists and I'm excited and a little bit afraid of where the series is going to go, but like afraid in a good way because my fear, my fear is that it's going to end. <laughs> And I'm not ready. So I am hopeful. Oh my gosh. I don't know why or what the story would be, but like, what if this is like a murder bot situation where it's a bunch of novellas and then all of a sudden we just get like a full novel? I don't, I don't know. These work so well as novellas. I don't even know what a full novel would be about unless it's like Eleanor's full story from like being a child into like starting the school and helping Cade and like, all of that, that could, that, that probably could be a novel. I think her story is actually the only one that could be a full length novel. Also, I know it won't happen probably because I think both of their storylines don't have an ending of where this will happen. But like, does anyone else still want Nancy and Cade to end up together? <laughs> Like, I know Nancy's happy in her underworld, and Cade would not be happy there. Nancy would not be happy here. And Cade most likely is going to be Eleanor 2.0. But, like, I kind of want them to be together. <laughs> so, yeah. If you like Wayward Children, this is going to be another win. Particularly, if you really liked Lost in the Moment and Found, I'm almost positive you will love this one, too. Like, it really just feels like part two of that story in the best way. But now I'm going to go soak these in water because the mess and the lack of success is not doing it for me. So I realized while I was editing this that I never did an outro <laughs> and normally I would kind of just end it because I think I summed up my feelings on both of these books well enough that I didn't really need to come back and say more about it. But I kind of wanted to show what I actually ended up getting from that fossil kit. Because um, I ended up throwing the blocks of rockish dirt in bowls of water <laughs> because I got so frustrated trying to get them out. And what I got, all of that painful work that made a huge mess, which was my own fault, but still is a triceratops skeleton that is so tiny and does not 
fit together. I mean, it's, it does, but it doesn't. And I think what gets me is like, yes, it was $5. It was a kid's toy. It was not high quality. I understand that. But like, I've gotten a better quality toy from a Kinder Egg. And that's cheaper. <laughs> so why is this? And I'm not going to go pick it up because I'm like really cozy. But like, I have a Triceratops skeleton from a Kinder Egg. That so this is this is garbage. Um, so I got that, and I got my very tiny little Leopardon thing. Is that a Leopardon? Anyway, this this little guy, and my Charlie Brown rock, and my little fossil. That conceptually was cute, poor execution. My favorite is still this derpy Triceratops that actually came in this egg. I just have them all together. So yes. Those are mostly, those are my stupid little trinkets. They will probably not end up on my dinosaur shelf because I don't like them very much. Except for the one, the derpy and the egg. Maybe let's keep everything in the egg. But, um, I still hate the paleontologist. I think I gave it two and a half stars. I could be convinced to drop it down to two. It's not good. It's just not. It's trying to do too much, and it does none of it successfully. But Miss Laden Parts Half Known was fantastic. I highly recommend it. And I am not only excited to read it again, but I stand by. I do think it's my favorite of the entire series. So it is absolutely worth picking up. It, I mean, it's the way we're children. If you're interested, you're interested. And if you're not, you're never going to pick it up anyway. But it delivers. It absolutely delivers. And I think that was all I had to say. I mostly just wanted to show those terrible $5 toys and maybe don't ever buy them. Don't read The Paleontologist. Do read Mislaid and Parts Half Known. And I will see you guys in another video in the future. Bye.